Welcome. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning for an interview with our author in residence, Jack Gantos. And what a great morning for me. I wake up and I go out and get my paper. And there, above the fold, is a story about a record milestone in circulation that we'll, we expect to reach early next week. Heidi, Sunday, maybe. Heidi's doing the counting. We'll see. 1.5 million circulation. So that's fantastic. And then I get to come and listen to uh, a great interview. Um, this is our first ever author in residence that we are happy to present with uh, great support from the Friends Foundation in honor of the library's fifth anniversary in this building. So thanks to the Friends and everybody who donates to the library. That's what made this possible. Not too late this fiscal year. And thank you all for coming. And I'm going to turn it over to our staff and our visiting author. Well, I'll second that. Thank you all for coming. And thank you for joining us this morning. In the past, we've done author interviews for Channel 10. And it's always been one of those things where we're in a closed room. And it's like, you know, five, four talking heads and things like this. <laughs> so this is so great because we have you here, you have us here. And we hope that we'll have a great hour. And um, we would just like to say welcome to Iowa City, Jack Cantos. Thank you very much. And thanks for talking with us today about your books and your writing career. Um, I'm the picture book selector at Iowa City Public Library, so I get a lot of fun. I get to buy lots and lots of picture books, including we have multiple copies now of all the Rotten Ralph books. We even went to Al Libris and bought copies, you know, that weren't available anymore. And wow. Rotten Ralph has become one of your best known characters, certainly for young kids. And he's reached uh, or gone past his 30th birthday. How did he come about, and what makes kids laugh at Ralph? <laughs> Um, first off, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's very exciting to be here and to be in Iowa City. Um, it's my first trip to Iowa City, and it's sort of a delayed trip. I've sent so many other people to Iowa City. Um, I taught at Emerson College for many years where I got my BFA in creative writing. And then uh, we started a master's program in creative writing. And then Marvin Bell, who actually has a plaque out there, came to, uh, to Emerson and gave us advice on starting an MFA program, which of course we discarded immediately and then uh, <laughs> started our own MFA program so that we wouldn't look like Iowa. Exactly, you know. I mean, nobody could be Iowa but Iowa. And then, uh, so we, we started that. And then we had all these really great poets and great prose writers, so where would we send them? We'd send them here, you know. So, you know, I've been in touch with a lot of my old students, and you know, they said, "Oh, you have to go to Dave's." <laughs> so, um, I haven't been there yet, so you know, I haven't been there because I'm here. Uh, otherwise, I'd be horizontal, I believe. So, that said, as an introduction, it is uh, such a pleasure to be here, and and pleasure to do certain things. Like see that uh, the walk down Iowa Iowa Avenue, Iowa Avenue. that's just uh, brilliant, you know. And, and it uh, celebrates really writing in this city. You can't get away from it. And I, I love that. I love being captured by the history of writing here. As for your question, um, I always get to everything the long way, apparently. Um, Rotten Ralph came about because uh, I was writing picture books at uh, Emerson College as an undergraduate. And I liked picture books. And uh, I liked the art, and I liked the humor that was in picture books. But um, I wasn't quite sure how to write picture books, and nobody at Emerson was writing picture books. In fact, there was very few people around <laughs> writing picture books. So uh, I would call people up. So Jim Marshall, Jim Marshall mm -hmm. did the George and Martha books, The Stupids, remember The Stupid Step Out? I read The Stupid Step Out, and I thought, God, that is so funny. You know? <laughs> That's really wonderful. So uh, I called him up on the phone and uh, went over for advice. And he was just a, a lovely, lovely person. And he lived under the Bunker Hill Monument, you know, and it was like hot. It was so hot. And Nicole was with me, the illustrator of the Rotten Ralph book. So we both went up for advice and went to the door. He's a lovely Texas gentleman with great manners. And he said, would you like a drink? And I said, oh, God, I'm so thirsty. Yes. <laughs> So I came out with like an eight ounce tumbler of scotch and I was like, here. So I have no idea what he taught me. And, and so, 
So then I, uh, I called uh, Margaret Ray from Curious George fame, and she lived uh, on Hilliard Street, right off of Brattle Street in Harvard Square, right by, you know, in the shadow of Harvard, right by ART. So I went down there, and uh, she only drank tea. So that's, uh, I remember everything she said. And she was just a, a lovely person. So Boston, you know, Boston did have a lot of people in, in the field that you could access, and you could call up the publishers, and you could get advice from them, and they would invite you into their office. And so it was a very welcoming kind of revolving door. So um, I'd written a, a lot of, um, a lot of well, well-deserved well rejections. And so, you know those books that are not j works of genius that nobody understands? No, these were books that were not works of genius, and everybody understood. <laughs> You know, their flaws. And I was always the last to know, of course. And so, um, so finally, after getting some good advice, uh, that, that little line, write about what you know about, you know, sort of occurred to me. And I, I thought, well, you know, we were a cat family growing up. We liked cats. And so um, I went to the Boston Globe, and I, I got out of the used pet section. Um, there was a cat you know, under the used pet section, and from Harvard University. It was from Harvard, from an Australian couple moving back. You know, they got their degrees, now they're moving back. And so I called them up, and uh, Nicole and I went over there. And it was just like a psychodrama. He was, uh, he was stomping back and forth, and she was crying. And uh, he said, I'm here for the cat. She lets out a wail, you know, and he's smiling. <laughs> We're finally going to get rid of that animal. And so... Uh, so finally, it was under their bed, you know, and you know, you don't want to crawl under a graduate student's bed looking for some, and but I did, and I finally found that cat, and it was just hissing away. It was really upset with me. So I grabbed him. We didn't have a cat carrier because we weren't sure, and so we just had a bath towel. So I was like, put him on that and rolled him up, you know. And so I had this cat that was spitting mad, you know, little tail sticking out one end, his head out the other. He said goodbye. He was, again, he was very pleased. He was just crying crazily. And uh, so we got on the subway, because uh, we didn't have a car either. So this cat's just spitting away. You know, people are like running from us, you know, calling the ASPCA. And finally, we go around a corner, and, uh, you know, it's steel wheels on a steel track, and it just goes, Arr! and the cat goes, ha, 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 and flops over. And I'm like, oh my God, the cat had a coronary, you know. So, <laughs> I don't know what to do. Now I've got this dead cat in a towel, you know. So get home, phone's ringing. I put the cat down, you know, unlock the door, put the cat in the hall, you know. So I go to answer the phone, and it's the woman. And she goes, how's my cat? I'm like, you know, I'm thinking your cat's down under before you are. So, so I'm like, I say, oh, your cat's you know, a lovely animal. And, uh, okay, you know, because you knew she was feeling it. You know, she had lost her cat, so I was trying to be nice. So uh, then I went back out the hallway. The cat was gone. It had revived. The cat had fainted. I didn't know animals could faint, and it had. And it took me about three days to find it. And then it was just, a, you know, a very irregular sort of sociopathic cat. And so then I wrote Rotten Ralph, you know, because the cat was kind of on the rotten side. And then kids respond to it. Because also, it's got that unconditional love quality to it, that no matter what Ralph does, that Sarah, his very sweet owner, you know, loves him. And it's, and it's that sort of universal message, I think, that parents give their kids. And that is, you know, I don't like what you do, but I love you anyway. And I think that kids really respond strongly to that. And I know I certainly did as a kid. You know, I did a lot of kind of goofy, wrong things headed things, and, you know, nobody made me sleep outside as a result of it, you know. <laughs> so I think kids dig that part. Someone uh, who recently checked out some of the books because it's a task on her summer reading list, she said, my daughter took Rotten Ralph to daycare and they all love him. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> oh, I thought that was going to go the other way. <laughs> you know? It can sometimes. People hallucinate when they read that book. And they get Ralph and the devil mixed up, you know? <laughs> well, Jack, we've, uh, many of us have had time with you yesterday and have heard a little about your upbringing and your family. But for those new in the audience and at home, would you share with us a little about your childhood, um, schooling, traveling and moving around, your family in particular? So um, kids are always interested in 
what you were like when you were a kid. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah, because I'm always interested in what they're like now. <laughs> um, I was born in western Pennsylvania in uh, coal mining, farming, you know, sort of depressed area. Um, in actually kind of an experimental depression era town um, put together in part by Eleanor Roosevelt called Norvelt, Pennsylvania. It was one of those homestead, depression era homestead towns. And uh, so we were uh, born out there. My grandfather's coal miner, Doug Cole, all his life, you know, two shifts during the war, took care of the blind mules, you know, that never, you know, they would take those mules down into the shaft and they'd never come out, you know, until they weren't breathing. And so he would take care of those and he dug coal and he was just a great, big, wonderful man. I loved him and I loved my grandmother so much. And um, I don't think we had kindergarten, so I went to first grade there. It was nice. They had a school. Um, and Eleanor Roosevelt made sure there was a school. There was not a school plan. The federal government had no plans for a school in this town. And Eleanor said, you know, you've got to educate those kids, you know. Otherwise, they just stay in the Depression <laughs> forever. And uh, so I went there for first grade. And then my dad, who had been in the Navy in World War II, had left Western Pennsylvania, had been in the South Pacific, had seen sunshine, palm trees, you know, beaches, you know, nice looking water that, you know, wasn't, you know, <laughs> brackish or something some filled with slag. So um, he had come home, married his high school sweetheart. They had three kids in a row, like just about everybody, probably from the war. And then he probably woke up one day and said, oh, my God, where am I? What am I doing here? And who are these kids? So he rejoined the Navy. <laughs> and they shipped him out. You know, I think both of us were winners. And so... Um, and so eventually they sent him to Barbados in the West Indies. And, you know, he was having, I'm sure, a great time. And so we wanted some of that great time, too. So we went down there. And then I went to school. I went to British schools because it was still the British West Indies at that time. So I went to British schools down there. And they were great. They had great literature and really, uh, you know, terrific, you know, reading. It was just so much fun. And, and the kids were great. The teachers were great. And literacy in the island of Barbados is like 95%. I mean, it, it's very, very high. If you ever go there on a vacation, you know, the, the person is mixing your drink and talk to you about anything. They're all very, very well educated and, and, and totally literate and articulate. I love that place. So at any rate, so we went there uh, and stayed there until, uh, I don't know, partway through fifth grade. I came home from school. We were doing pretty good. We had a driver. And it, Pulled up, and I walked in the house, and my mom said, see those new suitcases? I said, yeah. She said, fill them. We're out of here. And that was it. Filled them, gone. Never said goodbye to anybody, except my dog, who I left in the driveway. And then we moved to Florida. And uh, my dad had gone bankrupt, so we, you know, hide it from the children. Just drag them off in the middle of the night. And then, uh, then I went to Florida, and then uh, Florida was completely different. You know, because then it was like millions of people moving to Florida for the construction industry, and they couldn't build things fast enough, and you were always in portables, or we went to school in old naval barracks and that kind of thing. I went to school in, in an old prison. They had built a new prison for the prisoners, and they took the old school and rehabbed it, or the old prison and rehabbed it into a, into a school, and it was depressing. I mean, like, you'd look at the windows, and you'd still see the, where they torched the bars off. <laughs> And, you know, the stuff that guys would scrawl into the wall was still there. You know, you get an art lesson on anatomy. <laughs> and then uh, from Florida, um, I was supposed to go to University of Florida, and I didn't go. I, I, I didn't go. I went up there. But it was like, you know, I wanted to write books. I was really interested in writing books. And so, uh, but they only had English programs, and English programs are not the same as writing programs. They really aren't, and so you couldn't take creative writing courses until your your junior year. So, you know, that just didn't seem right. So, I decided not to go and write books on my own, which didn't work out very well. I ended up in a little bit of trouble, which I'm sure we'll get to, and. Uh, <laughs> So that, you know, that kind of became my childhood. But as a child, I started keeping journals. And I started keeping those journals because my sister had a journal, and I was just simply a copycat. I was just a younger brother copycat. And, and I kind of, it kind of caught on to, for me, you know, to write and draw in them and put down my ideas and my feelings and my thoughts about things. And 
And to me, one of the things about the journals that I loved as a kid, and I recognized this as a kid, uh, were, there were two things. And one was, it was like a room. It was like your own room. And I never had my own room. But when you opened that journal, it was like opening a door to your own bedroom or your, your own private place. And I loved that part. And the other part was, it's like if you had a really great day, like if you had that uber birthday, you know that birthday that they finally came through, you know, <laughs> like, like they actually listened to what you wanted and then they went and got it. And then you're like, whoa, mom, dad, you know, the Taj Mahal, thanks. And so, um, you know, and then, you know, then later, you know, you like had some really crummy days, right? And then you could go back to that day that you wrote about and you could kind of like live off the fumes of that day, you know, it was still there and you could recreate that in your mind. And so the journal was, was a, a great way to renew those uh, feelings of accomplishment or, or really powerful feelings. So I liked that a lot. So that's kind of what got me going. And reading too, I read a lot. I was a library rat. And so um, at all the schools I went to, because I went to 10 schools in 12 grades, I mean, everybody knows this, you know, and if you don't, please write this down, that you know, if you're the new kid, walk straight into the school, right down to the library, go right to the librarian, look them right in the eye and go, I'm a reader. You know? <laughs> and they go, you, come with me. You know? <laughs> I will take care of you and protect you from all the wicked sociopathic children in this school. <laughs> and then you can just hang out there. You know, and I was that kid. I became that AV kid. You know, I could thread like a movie projector, and you know, like you know, over the lot. Call Jack. He's the only guy that can run this thing. You know, so I spent a lot of time in the hallway. <laughs> so Jack, talking about being a reader, um, a lot of your characters, you've got kind of this naughty Ralph character that we're familiar with, and this really intense, high-strung. Joey Pigza um, character. Can you talk a little bit about children and reading and kind of these more difficult types of characters and why you might like to feature them or your feelings about children and some of the, and the characters, you know, a lot of the books always have characters that are a little bit edgy or a little bit pushy or, you know, kind of clawing at the world a little bit, trying to get maybe a little bit more perception, and then once they get that perception, maybe trying to, to parse that perception with some kind of understanding of it that, that gives them some balance in their life, you know. So, you know, Ralph is kind of, you know, he's, Ralph is just two-dimensional. You know, he's like, he does something rotten. I mean, in fact, he's like 99% rotten. <laughs> and then he has like 1% for contrite. And then, yeah. <laughs> And then, you know, he takes a nap, and then he's rotten again, you know. And then, you know, that's his, you know, his arc, his character arc. But then as you move up with, you know, human characters and older characters, then the arcs begin to change, and they're, they're not quite as obvious. So if we took somebody like Joey Pigza, for instance, who's an ADHD kid, he's a very, you know, very hyperactive kid. He's a great kid. He has great heart. That's a book that I wrote from the first person point of view. And uh, primarily I wrote that be, you know, from that point of view because all those kids get judged by the outside. Because you know, when I grew up, all the really hyperactive kids, which they just called active, very active, very, very active, off the charts active, unteachable, willful, bad. You know, I mean, there was like those kinds of stages. And they had the desk in the hallway. Remember the desk in the hallway kids? There was like a whole club going on out there. And, <laughs> You know, and they were having more fun than we were. You know, you'd be looking through that little window on the side of the classroom, and they're out there with a super ball, you know, just <laughs> wailing it against the lockers. You know, like, woohoo! You got their shoes off, you know, swinging their belt around, you know, half dressed, running up and down. I'm like, dang, you know, they're good. But they were always, you know, they always got kind of characterized in a bad way. Well, because I was always the new kid, I, I met those kids easily, you know, because they were very friendly. And the other kids, the core kids, were, you know, they were just with their other core kid friends. So I always knew them as friends. People always kind of talked about them as bad kids, and, and I knew that wasn't true. And I knew um, 
I knew them from more the inside out. I knew them because they had big hearts and they were generous and they were kind and they were fun and sure they made a lot of mistakes, but who cares? You know, you're judging people by their inner qualities, not their exterior qualities. And so for that kid, then I just wanted to turn that kid inside out from the first person point of view so we could examine the difference between who he is and what he does, you know. And, and so we could turn, the, turn his interior life into something just as obvious as his exterior activities. And uh, so, you know, that became, you know, sort of a, a, a specific conscious approach. With the Jack Henry books, those five books of, are autobiographical short stories, and they're all based on my journals as a kid. So I kept all my journals. When we moved all those times, I was allowed to take books and journals and clothes. And the clothes were easy, because my mom, like, beginning of every school year, we'd go to Sears, right? You get brown pants, yellow pants, black pants, blue pants, a matching shirt for every color of pants. And then you'd get that one jacket, you know, that reversible jacket, plain on one side, plaid on the other side, you know? That was it. You get a brown belt, a black belt, brown shoes, black shoes, you're ready. You're good to go, you know? Whole new set of underwear, and you're going for it. Till Christmas, right? And, and you know, re you renewed the portions that you had messed up. <laughs> so, for me, keeping those journals, which I have about 200 journals, um, keeping those journals was really important. And like I said, I would feast off of those journals. So it, eventually, it occurred to me, you know, writing, I'd written the Ralph books that you know I should write about my childhood as well. So I reread those journals, pulled out all the good stories, and and then rewrote them, reconstructed them, but also from the first person point of view. But Jack Henry is a character that um, has perhaps more perception than ability to deal with it. You know, and so so and it's that awkward kind of a little bit of an awkward stage where where you can see the fullness of the world, you can see the richness of the world, and you're both you know, kind of inventing yourself and finding yourself simultaneously, but you're awkward at it at the, at the same time. And, and so I, I like dealing with him, and, and I also like dealing with family matters. And I, and, and I am very dedicated to writing realistic fiction. I'm not your science fiction kind of fantasy kind of guy. When we move up, to young adult books, then there are much more, you know, sort of edgy characters and desire lines. There was a a, a murder suicide that I knew one of the the girls at school in, in tenth grade that there were these two girls and they were having a relationship which was like 1967 Fort Lauderdale, which of course was absolutely taboo and. Somebody had outed them, and they were being hounded. They were being hounded religiously on campus and by uh, the other students. And so I knew the one girl, but and eventually the, the hounding got so bad, and the pressure was so bad that she, her dad was a cop, and they had a murder-suicide pact. She shot her girlfriend, killed her, and then turned the gun on herself, and the bullet deflected, and they found her unconscious. You know, and They didn't try her for murder because they just thought anybody who would like another same-sex person, must be mentally ill. So they sent her off to a mental institution, and, uh, and then they brought her back to the school, and then she was hounded some more. So those kinds of characters, then when, once we move up to the young adult characters, then you become, you know, the, the characters become more capable, and they become uh, deeper thinkers. They're more um, intellectually... Um, probing with the, and, and demanding of the world around them. So I, I move into that. And I suppose, that, then that, does that take us to whole of my life? <laughs> uh, almost. 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 Uh, I'll pause there. Uh, I think I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and jump in again wearing my little picture book, you know, queen hat here. Um, and I know that you've had a long-standing working relationship and friendship with Nicole Rubel. Yes. And um, that's kind of how you all got your start in the publishing world. Um, but I'm curious, um, as an author, you are the crafter of words, of story, but you work closely with Nicole, I would assume, as the illustrator. Do you get to work with illustrators, for example, who illustrate the covers of books, and also what role does vision play in your storytelling? Do you hmm. hear the words first, or do you see the story? I'm curious. Hmm. That's a lot of good questions. Um, with Nicole, just working with Nicole to, to start there, um, it's 
great to work with somebody long-standing that you've had a long-standing relationship with. Um, and I've known Nicole now since 1974, something like that. So, you know, and we've done a lot of Rotten Ralph books. We've done like 18 Rotten Ralph books together, you know. So, so you kind of begin the left hand, right hand. You know each other pretty good. Um, and it's great to work with her. I, you know, I write the stories and then she does the illustrations. But and that sounds cut and dry, but it's not, you know, because I'll write the stories, I'll send her the stories, she sends me the black line, you know, preliminary illustrations. I draw on hers and she's, you know, marking up my text. And we do exchanges back and forth, you know, a few times, not until you drive each other insane, you know, but enough times so that you begin to kind of, you know, sort of canvas everybody's best ideas and, and use those best ideas. And uh, I like that. You know, I don't think it has to be like, you know, I'm the author, these are my words, and your job is just to illustrate my books, you know, and a kind of illustrator surf, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and it's not that way at all. It really is, it's great teamwork, and I love that teamwork part of it, and that's what I think keeps it fresh and, and, and keeps it exciting. That, that's, you know, a nice part, but the illustrated part, um, how does that work for me when I'm, when I'm thinking? And, I, and I, I really do think, I mean, I'm not like Kandinsky. I don't have, you know, synesthesia where I, you know, I see a color and, and, and it reminds me of a word or, you know, some, you know, like, you know, you know, that kind of thing. I don't have uh, simultaneous sensory responses to one stimuli. stimuli. So, but I do see things very clearly, very filmically. And then I sort of translate down from that. I'm, I'm very aware of that. And I think some people must just see, just run the words. And I think that's a great too. But I really am aware that, that it's all visual in my head and then I'm just, and then I'm getting it down. And then I do, then I do like 30, 40 rewrites per, per book. I really love rewriting. The first draft to me is just a, a little bit of a nightmare. But the rewriting is just like, you know, now you, it's playtime. You know, and that's really when, when it's not so visual. Then I'm really just working in words, you know, and just playing with my tools. But that first draft is, is very visual. In my journals, um, a lot of times I draw, and the drawing will lead to ideas too, mostly with Ralph, but also with the short stories. Like, as a kid, I would do all these maps of my neighborhoods and maps of my house and maps of the school, and, and I would draw where everything interesting happened and, you know, these very kind of elaborate maps, and those maps actually then became the Jack Henry books because they were real physical evidence of where things happened and how I felt at those sites. So I think the visual world is uh, it was very powerful for, for the verbal world. Jack, I am the uh, selector uh, for middle grade fiction, um, so I'm particularly interested in your Joy Pigs and your Jack Henry stories. And what I would be interested to hear from you is what kind of uh, maybe research you did to, to understand ADHD mm -hmm. with, uh, in relation to Joy Pigs. And then um, also, could you discuss a little bit how Joey Pigs's relationship with his mother, father, and grandmother uh, evolves okay. through the through the stories. Um, the first part, when when I first started writing uh, Joey Pigs, uh, I was on a, I was on a school speaking tour. I do a lot of speaking in schools and working with kids on writing and teacher in service. You know, using creative writing approaches and in, in curriculum and that sort of thing. So I was, uh, I was in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is a great old town. You know, it's like a planned colonial city. You know, it's just really great. I think it was the capital of the United States for one day. Um, and, you know, there's King Street and Queen Street and Plum Street and Lime Street. You know, it's just very, very colonial, very British in that regard. So I was there and, uh, you know, speaking like I'm usually speaking. There's, you know, like 100 kids. And there's one kid sitting right there and, you know, and I don't know how this kid did it. He was just so brilliant. He was uh, like, I'm just up there, you know, and I'm, I'm doing my thing, I'm talking, you know, I'm cracking jokes, and I'm teaching, and you know, I'm just like juggling all my plates, you know, and, and having a really good time, which I love having with kids. And, and this kid was like, you know those unibody desks? They, they weld them together, you know, and, and this kid somehow, he had his ankle behind him, 
and it was stuck behind the, the seat. But his ankle was like a universal joint, and this kid could do like, like a 360 around, you know? And every time I would start a sentence, that kid would, boom, he'd pounce on it, and he'd finish it out loud, right? And it, and it just became kind of like a, like a comedy routine, you know? And, and it was click and clack the whole time. And so, you know, I'm having a great time. He's having a great time. About a half an hour into it, he's not having a great time. And suddenly, so the, the worm starts to turn, and, and, he, and the teacher's over in the corner, and she's dealing with another kid, and, you know, he's spinning around, he's trying to get her attention, trying to get her attention, trying to get her attention, and finally he can't take it anymore, and he just screams out, you know, in the middle of the class, teacher, teacher, I forgot to take my meds. And she just pointed to the door, and that kid went, choo, on a, like a frozen rope right out the door, and you heard him run down the hallway, right, and then punching the lockers all the way down, bam, 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 <laughs> all the way to the nurse's office, you know, for his meds, you know. And I'm like, whoa, that kid, that was so great. You know, that was like, I love that moment. It was such, such a great moment. And that's, you know, kind of when, you know, it reminded me of all my old friends, Kenny Deal, who was totally ADHD, and Frankie Pagoda, who was totally ADHD. You know, all these kids that I went to school with and knew, and knew his friends. And I'm like, that's one of my people right there. You know, there he is, you know. So I started writing that book, and then I thought, you know, it's a subject, ADHD is a subject that you can't mess around with. You don't want it to be one of those, like, 70s problem novels, you know, like the disease du jour book, you know, like Whitman Press. Remember, they would always put out, uh, you know, my dad who we visit every Sunday in the penitentiary, you know, my mother who lives under the red light. And then, you know, so, you know. <laughs> You know, they had a book for every problem, you know, and so when, so I didn't want that, you know, and I didn't want it to be a textbook, you know, it's a, it's a human story, you know, but I wanted the details, the ADHD, the medical details, the condition details, I wanted those to be accurate because you, you know some kid with ADHD is going to read that book and they're going to, you know, they want it to be authentic. And so um, then I read a lot of texts on it and consulted with doctors and then, you know, and then I just kind of let that filter in and then I went back to the character work, you know, and, and, and got that in and, and did it that way. As for the arc of the characters, I mean, Joey, you know, Joey, you know, has the big heart and, you know, he's always trying to do the right thing. He really is trying to do the right thing. Whether he succeeds at it or not, his intentions are always good. And he's a good kid. He's a really good kid. I, I love that kid. The mother is, can be good at times, but the mother's character, again, there are four books. There'll be a fifth one eventually once I get to it. But the mother's character is kind of circular. You know, like, like she was out of the picture for a while in the first book. And then when she gets really, really contrite, then she kind of pulls herself together. And she's, very, she's filled with guilt and sorrow, and she becomes then the, kind of the good mom. But then once she becomes the good mom, you know, and she's on top of her game, then, you know, we have a little bit of erosion, you know, up there. And she kind of slackens up a little bit and just starts going down the other slope again. And then when she goes down the other slope, you know, then, you know, you can see that, you know, Joey's life becomes a little less patterned, a little less organized, and, and so it's, it's difficult for him to live under those circumstances. The father is kind of an up and down kind of character, you know. I spent every Saturday for a lot of years of my life at the Elks Club with my dad. And, uh, you know, drinking like 20 Coca-Colas and eating like, you know, a bucket of peanuts. And so, and listening to guys tell jokes, you know. It's, how I grew up, and so, so at any rate, there are a lot of guys like Carter Pigza, who you know are you know nice guy, great talker, good intentions, absolute no follow through whatsoever. You know, like no sense of you know toughing it out, no sense of being responsible, no sense of being a great dad, no sense of standards, um, no sense of what a kid needs or doesn't need. You know, and 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 in one sense, you know, he's he's a great character. He's a terrific character. And he's got lots of personality. If he just had, you know, if he just had a few basic parenting tools that he could use, he wouldn't be so bad, but, but he's not. 
And he's ADHD too, but he doesn't get any medication outside of drinking. Drinking is his medication, you know, which a lot of ADHD people, you know, find the bottle to be, you know, their friend. And so that's his character. So he comes and goes. He's just, he's there, he's not there, he's always full of crackpot ideas. And then the grandmother, the grandmother, I love the grandmother because she's tough as nails. And, and she's the one that's really raised him. And she's, and, and, you know, she's the anti-granny. You know, she's not the, the, the tall house cookie, baking granny. You know, she's like just about smacking him around, you know, like threatening him, you know, if you don't straighten up, I'm putting you in the refrigerator. You know, and, you know, that, you know she's a tough granny. And she's done some pretty mean things to him, but she's always there. She still loves him. Even though she's tough, she loves him. And that becomes sort of his anchor. And then... Uh, yeah, and then until she doesn't, you know, and, and then she moves on. And she's always smoking. So she's on oxygen, right? So as she smoking, she's got to turn her oxygen off, smoke a butt, you know, turn it back on, you know, fill those lungs up. So, so just as a side thing, so I was with my friend Peter Virgilio, who was uh, an MFA poet at, at Iowa. He's from Boston. So I was in the North End. He's an Italian kid from the North End. So I went down to see him. He's a great kid. And so we're driving down the street. He goes, hey, look up at that, you know, apartment, you know, and it's like this old brownstone building, you know, like Paul Revere's neighborhood. And it's all blown out, like an explosion. And I said, what happened? He said, smoking and oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it is slightly dangerous, you know. <laughs> we don't recommend those two things. So, Jack, you were here an entire day yesterday talking fourth or sixth graders and teens and adults. And I don't know if you noticed, but um, in a typical Iowa Midwestern fashion, not one person asked you about doing time. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and you probably, you almost escaped without having to talk about a hole in my life, but um, here's your chance. Uh, I know. I'm, I, I'm, I'm bringing it up. Yeah, I'm, I'm very glad you've broken through the... the the threshold, the, the lovely, soft, welcoming threshold of Midwestern manners to, yes. to really get to the point. <laughs> and well, they were all talking about behind you. That's the Midwestern. You know, after you left, everybody probably said, he, did, he went to jail? You know? Yeah. So He's writing those picture books? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I mean... When I, when I went to college, when I finally went to Emerson College, you know, I, I paroled from prison to college. And that's how I got to college, is uh, I uh, applied to college while I was still in prison, and then when I got accepted to college, then they let me out. They thought, wow, that could be a pretty good trick. So, <laughs> but just to roll back a little bit, um, here's how I went to prison um, in chains. But, um, so I was living, uh, it was 11th grade, I was in 11th grade, my parents you know, were in Fort Lauderdale, and then they moved, they moved to uh, San Juan in Puerto Rico. So I moved with them, and my dad was uh, rehabbing a Holiday Inn on, uh, San Juan, in San Juan, right on the beach. And so it was two wings of the hotel, and they would close down one wing and work the other wing, and one thing or the other. So we all got rooms, I had my own room, you know, my own hotel room, so I was living in a, in, in the Holiday Inn in San Juan during 11th grade. I never went back to school. I just skipped half of 11th grade. And I'm living in a hotel room and working. I was a, an electrician's apprentice. And I'm not good at electrical work, so I don't even think about it. I'd melt the head off of a pair of Klein side cutters like once a week. So, so at any rate, uh, by about 12th grade, I thought, you know what? I ought to go to, call. I ought to, go to school. You know, it's probably... Getting a high school diploma is probably a good idea. So, because uh, I had no future in electricity, and um, so I went back to Florida. They sent me back to Florida, and so I started living with some friends of theirs. And I started drinking a lot, you know, like because I had no supervision, you know. And well, I mean, I can't blame it on no supervision, really. I mean, I was really motivated to drink a lot, and and it was a great personal choice for me. And so, uh, so, and I drank a lot, and then I threw up a lot. You know, it was like, you know that cycle, that early cycle? It's like, you know, it's like, you know, to cure yourself from smallpox, you got to get a little of it. And so, 
So I drank a lot, and then uh, they kicked me out. They kicked me out, and then I moved into this wonderful, it was fabulous, it was a great period of my life. It was a welfare motel in, off of Broward Boulevard in Fort Lauderdale. It was called the King's Court. It was run by Davy Crockett's great-great-granddaughter, oh. and her name was Davy Crockett, like the 12th or something. And, you know, and, and it was me and all the other welfare people. And I lived there, and I had a car. I had a job. I worked 40 hours a week in my senior year in high school as a, at public supermarket as a stock boy and bag boy. Made my own food, paid my own rent, bought my own clothes, everything, the whole show. And I thought, dang, I'm an adult. You know, I was like the shell of an adult. But I thought I was an adult, you know. And then I didn't go to University of Florida because, you know, they didn't have that program. And also, this is the other thing about college. I always thought college was like a step up, you know. Like my high school in Fort Lauderdale, Plantation High, was like a, a giant sports facility with a small academic institution, like a tick <laughs> attached to the side of it, you know. And when I went up to University of Florida, it was the same dang thing. You know, it was like, oh, the, look, you know, it's a sports program with, you know, a couple courses attached to it, you know. So I didn't go because it just didn't feel like, really, it didn't feel like you're going, you're going to grade 13, you know, and that just didn't feel like it for me. So uh, then I thought I could write books on my own, and then, of course, I couldn't. You know, I just didn't know what I was doing, reading and writing kind of wildly. So then... Uh, then I moved down to St. Croix because my parents moved there. And so I was down there and was working construction again. And I thought, well, I'll write books at night. You know, why, why not? A lot of people have done this, you know. But I couldn't get that done either. And, you know, I was drinking a little bit more and using illicit drugs. And so, um, and then I thought, I've got to get off of this island. And then I ran into people that offered me this really fabulous opportunity. So <laughs> I ran into this British couple. So they said, look, you know, we're looking for a nice kid like you. I said, well, you know. I mean, you have come to the right place. I am a very nice kid. And they said, great, we've got a yacht, a 60-foot yacht with 2,000 pounds of hashish on it. And all you have to do is help us sail this boat to New York City, and we'll give you $10,000 in cash. Now, you, re you might remember, some of you may remember, <clears throat> like 1970, $10,000 in cash was like more than most people were making per year, you know. And that's like four years of private school. And I was like, whoa you know, count me in, I'm in on this, you know. Like, I didn't know how to sail, I didn't know anything. <laughs> Get on that boat, and we sail out, we'll run aground in the harbor. I mean, on the way, you know, like, I wasn't 100 yards off the mooring when, boom, we hit a coral reef, you know. Like, dang, I was like waiting for the tide all the time in that boat, you know. <laughs> we sail off this desert island, they had, they had ditched the hash on a desert island, they come in, we dig it up, yo ho ho, in a bottle of rum, you know. And I'm like, this is the greatest time of my life. I love this, you know. So I get that on, we sail off, you know. We don't even have a compass. You don't even know where America is, but figure it's big. It's out there somewhere, you'll run into it. We did, you know. About a month later, we hit New Jersey and uh, ran aground in a Coast Guard uh, base right there in Cape May. They sent out a little launch. <laughs> I go, you need any help? I'm like, oh, no, we're fine. <laughs> Waiting for the tide. <laughs> so, what we do. And so uh, they made it to New York City, and, uh, and then they started selling the hash, and then they started getting, you know, the cash, and then uh, I got my cash, and I was living at the Chelsea Hotel at the time, and I loved that, you know, at the Chelsea, because it was like that whole Andy Warhol funky scene, New York Dolls, you know, Max's Kansas City crowd, you know, I was like, whoa, who are these people? I don't know anything. And it was like, you know, I was like thinking, you know, Burroughs and Naked Lunch and, you know, you know and all that kind of activity. And, and, then, uh, and then we were all promptly arrested. And then, because uh, the whole thing had been watched from the very beginning, because all the hash had been bought with counterfeit money in Morocco, so the Secret Service was on that thing, and they had us, you know, air surveillance going across, you know, our little jagged line, you know, across the <laughs> Atlantic, you know. You know, so then, um, then I got, uh, then I thought I was going to get probation, you know, because I'm like, I'm a nice kid, you know, I'm like, okay, so I did something wrong. And then, uh, so I go to court, and uh, they gave me six years, and I was like, whoa. And I remember the judge. The judge was great. Judge Croak. <laughs> and prosecuting attorney Tierney and Judge Croak. I should have known right off the bat just from the language. And, 
So he said, before he sentenced me, he said, do you have anything to say for yourself? And I was standing there, and I, you know, it was a very sobering moment. And, and I, said, uh, I said, yes, I, I said, I'm a, I'm a nice kid. That's what I said, I'm a nice kid. And he looked at me, he said, nice kids don't smuggle dope. And I was like, dang, got me there. You know, so <laughs> I guess I didn't really have much of a comeback on that one. And so he, the gavel went down, you know, and six years. And so I just like turned to my lawyer. I said, what do I do? He said, you go with him. And this guard came and that was it, you know. So I was off. So that's what that book is about. But within that book, at the core of that book, I mean, it's a great story, the drug smuggling story and, you know, living in, on your own story and, and so on. But it's a book about books. It's a book about writing. It's a book about, you know, going to prison and thinking about being a writer and writing books and reading and, and how books really do affect you. And, uh, and they do affect you. So the book itself is not just like a, a little prison drug smuggling tale, but it's, got, it's larded with, uh, with, you know, sort of literature. Um, Jack, you often work with young people by visiting schools, public libraries, like um, your visit here. How do you encourage their creativity and also the confidence that they need in the importance of their stories? Well, you know, that you really touch on something there. It's... Um, you know, that issue of confidence, you know, how, how do you support it and how do you provide confidence? Um, a lot of writing is a bit of a confidence game, you know, as you well know, you face the blank page and, you know, you've got to have a little bit of gumption, you know, to go forward from there, you know. I mean, you have, you know, poets like Nicanor Parra, you know, said, you know, the writer's duty is to improve on the blank page. I doubt if he can do it, you know, and you're like, thanks, Nicanor, you know, I really appreciate that, <laughs> you know. <it's, laughs> but um, really, you know, when, when I went to college, you know, the, the whole idea of teaching creative writing, there was no such thing as teaching creative writing. It was more like they just say, get a sheet of paper, do something, read a couple books and come in. And if you have talent, it'll show up or the hand of God will come down and slap you silly and turn you into a writer and, and voila, you know, that's how it appears. You know, it just happens. You know, it's sort of like a genetic trigger goes off and suddenly you're like, whoo, I don't know what I'm doing, but I've channeled Thomas Wolfe, <laughs> you know. But it's a lot more than that, you know. For young people, you know, they really need, and I'm not, and really, I'll just take young people out of the mix. I think everybody. You need to understand that, you know, when you're thinking about writing, that there are some approaches to writing which are, which are very solid and, and very thoughtful. And, and, and so it would be basically this, you know. We usually start with journals, talking about journals and writing journals and keeping a journal. And because if you keep a journal, and keep a journal a little bit every day, write like 10 minutes a day. That's all I tell them. Like, like with a 10-year-old 10, 10 kid, I'm like, 10 minutes a day. You don't, you don't have to think an hour, two hours, four hours. You know, this whole writing thing, like, you know, they think of, you know, Joseph Conrad tied into his chair, you know, three days later, I finished Nostromo, you know, and they untie him, he stands up and collapses from exhaustion. You know, I mean, you know, that's not the picture we should be trying to promote. That kind of, you know, Victorian romantic approach doesn't work. So pragmatic thing. So get a journal. I want them to draw maps of their houses, do the map thing. And we want to do two things. Content. We want to look for content, what to write about. And then we want to talk about organizing that content so that we look at, at finding really good material and then how structure is really your friend when it comes to writing, that the notion of structure is not antagonistic to creativity. Because a lot of people think, oh, you know, if you're thinking beginning, middle, and end, problem, action, solution, well, then what you're doing is, you know, you're, you're gutting your creative impulse. You know, I'm like, no, you're not. You're really not. You're, you're organizing a lot of creativity here. And so, you know, we have to kind of get over some of those hurdles so that, what I will do with them is show them my maps of my neighborhood, and then I'll take you know, any one of those icons, I'll tell them a story, a whole story, I'll just tell them the story, and then after I tell them the story, then we'll put the structure of writing up there from you know, um, uh, characters, setting, 
problem, situation, action, crisis, resolution, then the double ending, the physical ending and the emotional ending, which of course you always need. So then we'll take the story I just told them and then we'll completely break it apart so that they can see the front of a story, you know, the content, and then they can see the invisible spine or the structure which holds it all together so that they know that in the journal they can be wild people. Ten minutes a day they are writing furiously, you know. And then when it comes to that second draft, now we start bringing some structure to it. And subsequent drafts, now we start looking at physical continuity, then the emotional responses of the characters. Then we go in and we just do the dialogue. Then we go in and we do images and adjectives. And we rake out the reallys and the varies and all the words that are just junky words anyway. And so, you know, we do some approaches that are sensible and give them some real tools that they can count on. When they have the tools they can count on, then they have the confidence to do it. You give them a blank sheet of paper and look at the clock and say, Okay, everybody, I want you to be creative. I'm going down to the teacher's lounge. <laughs> you, you little brown noser, you take names of anyone who, you know, who doesn't write, you know. You know, I mean, you got to give them a fighting chance, you know, the, you know, and you have to treat them like writers, give them the tools to write, and writing has to be part of the curriculum. It cannot be this kind of one-off thing, you know, like, like, Oh, the haiku is coming, <laughs> you know, you know, and one, I was absent that day. Well, that's it. That's creativity. It's over there, pal. You know, count your syllables and, you know, go do a haiku, you know, in the corner. And so, you know, that kind of thing doesn't give anyone confidence and it doesn't really support uh, writing and creativity. So I just think it, you just need some systematic bits in place. Well, Jack, we're, we're curious about your own writing process. Where do you write? Do you write every day? Do you work on one book at a time? Um, does your daughter Mabel get to look at your, your Rotten Ralph picture books as you're working? Does your wife proofread or look at your novels before they're published? Those kinds of things. I'm always saying to my wife, <laughs> I don't think you read my books. <laughs> and she says, oh, I read them in secret. I'm, I'm not really buying it. So when I really press it, she goes, really, look, she goes, I, have to, I hate to tell you this, she said, but whenever I start reading your books, they make me so sad, I can't, I can't read them. I'm like, I'm like, everybody else thinks I'm funny. And you, you know, you know. So, no, she doesn't proofread anything. You know, she's just she's like happy to get me out of the house and happy when I come back. Um, Mabel, Mabel, I bring in on certain things, and um, she's really good. She's got a good eye, like working on the picture books when you know when we're we're going through proofs and we're looking at stuff, how the the pictures and the words are working. She's really great there. She's got a great eye, and so it's fun to work with her there, uh, and get her advice. But basically, basically it goes like this. Um, Mabel's in school, so I get up first, I feed the cats, I, make, I start making the coffee, I get the newspaper in before somebody steals it off the front stoop. And then, uh, and then um, I get her up, I get her breakfast, we get you know, everything going, and then uh, I you know, take a quick shower, and then I'm out of the house. I drive her to school, and then I come back, and then I walk. There are two places I write. I have an office at home, but I don't like it. I don't like being at home. I, I've, I've written almost all my books exclusively in libraries. I mean, you know, and so for years, I went to the Boston Public Library, which was just like two blocks. I always lived right around the library. I mean, I would, if I lived here, I'd be living you know, right down the street. And so um, I go, like for years, Boston Public Library, I go into Bates Hall, which is a big research room, you know, big McKim design room, 55, you know, foot barrel vaulted, coffered ceiling, you know, great librarians at both ends, you know, help you with anything, you know. Writers been writing in there forever, you know, they have all the dictionaries and every, all the good stuff is there. You know, great 1913 set of century dictionaries out of Chicago, which are brilliant. And they removed them recently. They don't have enough money to rebind them. You know, it's just breaking my heart. So, 
At any rate, little things like that. So I would go there. So what I would do is I would try and go into the library, do at least two hours of first draft writing, two hours of rewriting, two hours of reading, and two hours of goofing off in the library. And that would be everything from going to shelves that I've never been to before, or the basement and digging around, you know, and just reading titles, just walking down the stacks and reading titles and going, whoa, look at this, that's so great, you know. You know, 17th century giants and dwarves, who knew? So, you know, <laughs> illustrated. You know, and then, but the BPL, like so many public libraries, the BPL kind of ran into this situation where they stopped in the city funding, you know, people who were in homeless shelters and had uh, programs. So they all started living in, in Bates Hall. And so that was really hard because your stuff would get stolen sometimes, you know, and, and it was, you know, it was getting very dicey. They didn't provide enough security. So then I moved over to the Boston Athenaeum, which is a subscription library, a private subscription library, which is fabulous. They have a fifth floor. It's called the writer's floor. It's a totally quiet floor. There's no cell phones in that library, none whatsoever. You cannot use a cell phone. They will throw you out. I mean, they will come after you and get you out of there. You know, and one woman said to me just the other day, she was there on her cell phone, she was cheating. And, and I walked right up to her and I said, you know, you can't use that cell phone in here. And she said, you know, we ought to get together and get a cell phone area. And I said, we ought to not do that at all. And I, <laughs> and, I, and I said, you know, there is one area where you can use the cell phone. Where, she said. I said, that's called outside. <laughs> and, and, you know, here. so. I got no issue with, you know, giving people the boot. <laughs> so, so at any rate, so I go up there and um, I have a locker there because I'm there so often. They gave me a locker. And I try and get to the library five days a week. When I'm working on a novel, five, six days a week. And then you know, I have very steady writing habitual habits. I try and write one book at a time. Sometimes you have a little overlap, but, you know, I try and stay really, you know, mono-minded about it because unconsciously your unconscious mind is really feeding that book you know and if you get too many projects going simultaneously it doesn't work but like you're I, probably journaling thoughts in your journal while you're writing though yes. that might be used for other books absolutely like in the back of my journal you know I always tab you know other book ideas that you know you know how your mind would crab off you know laterally and you know and I'll just go, go follow it you know and go oh that's really good but I'll use that later you know dang it just reminded me of something I forgot to write down this morning and so um, but but at any rate so that's what I do so I, I start it all in the library and I work completely in the library and I depend entirely on librarians they have great research librarians you can ask them any question any esoteric question at all and they're like whoa yeah, let me chew on that. You know, sure enough, you know, come back later on. They got all the books. They got Xeroxes. They got stuff for you. You know, it's like heaven. It's really, it's just like I can't imagine a better life than being able to go to the library every day. <laughs> yeah. You know? And speaking of which, we have been actually uh, asking questions and talking here for an hour. We did want people who have uh, come to the interview to have a chance, if any of you have a question, please, uh, you know, just feel free to raise your hand, and uh, maybe we can have a couple questions from the audience. Uh, go to the podium. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I probably wouldn't have done that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jack. I read. Uh, is it even on? <laughs> but you're closer. <laughs> <now>. <laughs> During prison, um, you you wrote in the margins of I can't remember what book. The Brothers Karamazov. And you couldn't take that with you. Right. Um, did you ever get a chance to track that down? Well, um, no, I did not get a chance to track that down. When I was checking out of prison, when they finally allow you to go, you know, you're eager to get out the door. <laughs> Because you always think there's uh, one last, you know, there's going to be one little hang up, you know, and, and oh, we're so sorry. <laughs> Wrong Jack Gantos, you know. And so the guard, uh, his name was Copley, um, 
so at any rate, so he just to open the front cover, and it said, you know, the U.S. Department of Corrections on the inside of that Brothers Karamazov, which was a Constance Garnett translation, which is not very good, so, you know, you can get rid of those. But at any rate, so he went, oh, that's ours, and he just, like, threw it over his shoulder. I was like, well, there that journal goes, you know. But I didn't dare say anything, because I was like, you know, there's the door, you know, and <laughs> I'd rather go there than there. So, um, so I went out. So... Uh, some enterprising librarian actually wrote the prison and uh, asked them to go down to the library and, and see whether their, you know, Karamazov was there. And so all they got back, though, was freedom of information, you know, kind of act paperwork and a little bit, of, a lot of red tape, you know, and so nobody's really done that. And I just, you know, like I just haven't felt like driving to Kentucky and knocking on the front door. Pardon me, I think I left a book here. <laughs> But almost 40 years ago, Karamazov, probably not very popular. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Yeah. Do you ever have people come up to you and say, oh yeah, I was with you in sixth grade and you wrote about me? No. No, nobody has come back. Uh -huh. And it's so bizarre because to me, even though I had to change names, um, I never did. Like the first, the the first, the, the first autobiographical book of short stories, Heads or Tails, that one. You know, all the names were real. You know, like all the whole neighborhood, not everybody's name was real. So that book was just going to press, just going to press. And my look, my editor called me, said, he said, you know, the attorney just wanted to know. You did change all those names. I'm, I'm like, no, 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 not at all. He said, well, you, you got to change names. I'm like, but you, once you know people by their name, you know, it's just never, it seems like some people, you know, like fit their name like people begin to resemble their dogs, you know, like, and so I had to change names. But even with that, you would think they would see themselves there. But no, nobody's ever come back. But a lot of that is just because I think I moved so much, you know, it's like, I'm not, you know, nobody thought of me either. <laughs> out of sight, out of mind. Patty. What do you hear back from particular, particularly your young readers? Well, I'm very fortunate um, in two ways. One, um, because I go to schools, I go to about 40, sometimes 50 schools per year. And, and work. And so I, you know, there's point of contact immediately, you know, so, so you're dealing with kids that are just telling you, you know, what they like, what they don't like, what's work, and, you know, I mean, they're, and, you know, they're, they're very honest, which is brilliant. So I have that, of course. And then I also get about, you know, I get a couple thousand letters a year from kids, and they, they write you letters. And they, I don't give out my email address, you know, because email's not the same thing as a kid sitting down doing letters. Now, out of those thousands of letters, a lot of them are teacher assignments. You know, like you'll get a packet of 20 letters, and they all start the same way. You know, my teacher told me to write this letter. So I am. I am five foot three. My eyes are brown. You know, and then the next one is the exact same thing. But then within them are the jewels. You know, like the kid that read your book and was like, you know, struck to write you these long, detailed letters. Whole of my life, I get incredible letters on, on whole of my life. You know, I have, in my briefcase, I have two, you know, you know, one from a young woman in college who was hanging out, you know, said, you know, I'm a nice kid, I was hanging out, I just, I did some stupid shoplifting. I, I shoplifted a bra and I got caught and it was the most humiliating thing I've ever done and I was so hard to get over it and then I read, you know, whole of my life and, you know, and she wrote me this long letter and, and that was really great and then I just got a letter from this kid at, at like one of those boot camp alternative high schools, you know, up in Maine, you know, and I'd go up there and chop trees and become a human being and so, and I got this like two page, just gorgeous, you know, deeply felt letter from him. So I get a lot of, a lot of mail that, so that you know that those books are not, they're not just entertaining them, but they're actually going beyond that. They're, they're sinking deeply into the hearts of those readers. I want to know what you do in your free time when you're not visiting all these schools, traveling internationally, doing workshops and author residences. What are your hobbies? What, what do you do to relax? Do you have, do you have another life? <laughs> 
I wish. Um, I wish. Uh, let's see. What do I do? Um, no, you know, I mean, I just, I go to the gym, you know, I'm a gym, you know, you know how that works, you know, when you're younger, you could join teams, you know, I was like on softball team, and I was on a street hockey league, and, you know, and then you get older, and like, oh, injuries, oh, man, you know, you're, you're like, a leave, that is my best friend, and then, you know, <laughs> and then you just go to the gym, so I just try and stay in shape by the gym, and then, you know, try and read books. The irony is that, you know, as a writer, you never feel like you're reading enough, you know, and it feels like your life is running you down in the street. You're just like, I want to read that. I don't have time to read that. You know, you're like, you're like and when you go on vacation, you're like, God, I'm reading all these books. Why can't my life be like this all the time? I'm in a library all day long, and I'm not <laughs> reading, you know. So that, and then, uh, you know, I have a family. I have a daughter who I really adore and so you know raising a kid is like you know like well that's what I'm supposed to be doing and so and I'm married you know and you know how that is since uh, very demanding and so <laughs> and I have cats I have two cats and I love them and um, I have a garden a little garden plot we have community gardens in the neighborhood so I, I do a little gardening and I have a bamboo garden I take care of my bamboo garden so I have a few little things but nothing exotic you know there's nothing extensive like I don't build ships in a bottle or any you know <laughs> go down to the basement you know and tinker you know <laughs> We have time for one last question. Yeah. So Heidi, it's yours. As an and then author, we... can you talk a little bit about the publishing side of things in terms of some of the changes in publishing, like downloadable audio or uh, picture books online, things like that? Mm. This is, uh, you know, in talking about, you know, where publishing is going, you know, in terms of how is technology, the new technology, going to affect publishing, and uh, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of discussion on this subject. You know, because Google was digitizing, you know, every book, right? And, you know, and those of us who, who try and make a little bit of royalty money off of books, you know, you, you don't want to give it away. You know, we saw what Napster did to music, you know, like, and, you know, it just gave it away. And, like, you know, musicians are, are no longer, the recording industry is just not the same anymore. The record industry or the CD industry just isn't, is not the same anymore. And so we don't want books to go down that same path. So everybody's a little bit concerned about how books get shared, you know, like, so electronic rights. Like, so now, like, with the Kindle, for instance, you know, when the, the Kindle, you know, and they download a book from Amazon onto their Kindle, am I going to get a royalty on that? Yes, you know, there will be a royalty on that. But then can the Kindle, can you share that book? You know, can it go from Kindle to Kindle to Kindle to Kindle? You know, then, then, you know, then people go, well, you know, it's just like a public library. They buy your book once, you get that one royalty, and then, you know, thousands of people read that book, and you get no royalty from everybody reading it out of the library. Well, not that I'm saying I should, but, but then you worry, though, that that Kindle thing could just spread, you know, out. And then because, then they start talking about, you know, just downloadable books like, even printing your own book. Like if you want to, you know, you want a hard copy of the book, you could just like from Amazon or from somebody just like print it, you know, and get a book. So people are, are really in the industry, agents and publishers, everybody's now trying to work together. The Authors Guild, Google, there's a suit against Google, you know, that I'm part of, you know, that, you know, about making sure that they pay. And, uh, and so that's really where we are. Now, somebody said to me the other day, they said, ah, we won't need publishers in the future. Everybody will just write their own book, and then on, online, you'll send it to an online publisher, and then, you know, you're an, you'll be a published author, and people can just download it. I'm like, oh, great. That's, I just can't wait for that day to come, you know, where you don't have a good editor, and you don't have a good copy editor, and you don't really have those filters, you don't have fact checkers, you don't, you know, and, and like all this... You know, and, and the book industry will be just as funky and phony at times as Wikipedia. You know, like, you know, like I even go on my page, and there's like, incredible mistakes all over my life, you know. And people are constantly, oh, I know Jack better than Jack knows Jack, you know. You know, you know so it, it's just, it's making me nervous. I don't know where it's going to stop. 
But I do know that, you know, that whatever it is, whatever format it is, and I don't mind whatever format it goes into, there just has to be some sort of way in which it's sold and that a royalty comes out of it. And it also, you have to do this, and you have to think this. And think about it in terms of newspapers, right? If those books go out in the world without publishing houses supporting them, right, we're going to lose a publishing industry. And when you lose it, you don't get it back. You know? And you know, the, all those great editors and all those people that are involved, they're real professional people. And, uh, and it would be a sad day not to have really great publishing houses. Well, we certainly hope that that day never comes. Uh -huh. yes. And uh, we also want to, I think, uh, close up shop for today. I wish it could go on and on and on. But in about 45 minutes, we've got tons of preschoolers, we hope, coming. <laughs> so we need, to live, we need to give Jack a little time to recover and ourselves a little time to set up. Thank you all for coming. We are Thank so you. pleased to have Jack Gantos as our first author. Thank you very much. Thank you.